leaving 2020 behind us. So here's to a much better 2021. Uh, as far as announcements, I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware the church will continue to be virtual until further notice. We will make sure that you have plenty of notice when we do uh, come back into the sanctuary for worship. I was asked to make an announcement about the lottery tickets. There are still tickets available. You can contact Ron or Tammy um, to purchase tickets. And if you have tickets that you have not yet sold and won't be able to sell, or if you have money for tickets that you have sold, uh, please return those to the church office um, or to Ron, and they're asking that all money or unsold tickets be turned in by the 15th at the latest. Um, but if you do have tickets, I'm guessing they're, they want those back so they can try to sell those. If you have any questions about any of that, let Ron or Tammy know. Any other announcements? All right, then let us prepare our hearts for worship. Join in our call to worship from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. He grants peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down hail like crumbs. Who can stand before his call? He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. And let us join in prayer. We praise you, God of creation, who fills us with the finest of wheat and scatters frost like ashes. You have declared your word to us and we have sought to be your people. You have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. May we live for the praise of your glory. Amen. 
Our first scripture reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 to 14. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor. Together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd keeps a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain and the wine and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. Our next lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fulfillment of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. And our gospel reading comes from John chapter 1, verses 10 to 18. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Maybe you've heard the joke about a young polar bear 
who approached his mother one day and asked, Mom, am I a polar bear? She said, of course you are, with a smile. Kind of thought it was not a question, but the young polar bear padded off, and he later found his father and asked the same question. Dad, am I a polar bear? He said, sure you are, son, and again was a little confused by the question. But over the next few days, the cub kept asking the same question over and over. Am I a polar bear? Yes, you are. Are you and mom polar bears? Yes, we are. 100% polar bears? Yes, son. And eventually they became a little frustrated with this and said, stop <laughs> with the questions. Why do you keep asking if you're a polar bear? And the cub looked up and said, because I'm freezing. <laughs> Today's scripture readings remind us that we are children of God. And there will be times in our lives when we might doubt that. We might look at our lives and think that we don't represent what it means to be a child of God. But just like that polar bear cub who admits to being cold, no matter what our lives look like, we are still children of God. Let us pray. Loving God, Remind us that we were chosen to be your children before the foundation of the earth. Guide us in living holy and blameless lives through Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. For over 50 years, I have been a part of the church. I still remember as a child sitting on the pew closest to the choir with my brother and sister only, because my mother was in the choir and my father was the organist choir director and that was the best place for them to keep an eye on us. But I loved everything about church. I loved the music, the hymns and the anthems. I loved the flowers, the prayers spoken in unison, the moments of expectant silence. And over the years, my love for the church has not diminished, but I will admit that it has changed. Like most of us, I have learned that to love the church does not always necessarily mean to like the church, because the church is made up of people with our peculiarities, our opinions, our egos, our anxieties. So to love the church, we start by loving it as it is, a gathering of the children of God, with all of our strengths and our growing edges, our inspirations and our discouragement, our wisdom and our folly, our energy, and sometimes our weariness. Our lessons from Ephesians and John's Gospel tell us that God destined us for adoption as God's children through Jesus Christ. Well, there, although there are times, like with that polar bear cub, when we might not feel very much like children of God, we are adopted and we belong to God. Each one of us is a daughter or son of God. And not only are we children of God now in this place, but we are also told that we were chosen before the foundation of the world. If anything will inspire all, I believe that will. Belonging to God even before the foundation of the world. There's a children's story that attempts to explain um, how belly buttons came to exist in this way. As we are coming down a conveyor belt from heaven, God uses an index finger and points to each one of us saying, I'll take that one, and that one, and that one. Kind of like the Pillsbury Doughboy. I don't know if he's even still around, but for those of us who remember the Pillsbury Doughboy. So for any of you that have a belly button, you have been chosen by God. And you might argue that every one of us has a belly button, and so I would say maybe every one of us is chosen by God. But we just have the good fortune of knowing it. Although none of us acts like a child of God all the time, somehow in God's profound wisdom, before the world was even created, we were chosen. And over and over again, scriptures tell us that we belong to God. Over and over again, scriptures talk about our inheritance as children of God. Anne Graham Lotz, who was the daughter of Billy Graham, um, was an author and evangelist. And she tells about the time that her house was broken into. And the night after the break-in, she was laying in bed, thinking of all the things that she still had, but that could be taken from her. She began to worry about losing her children or her husband, her health, her job, her reputation. 
And she wrote that just as anxiety was about to take over completely, she remembered words from scripture about her inheritance in God that can never be taken away. And she made an alphabetical list of all of those eternal blessings. She wrote, I am accepted by God, beloved by God, chosen by God, delivered by God, enlightened by God, forgiven by God. I have grace of God, hope for the future, inheritance in heaven, justification, knowledge of God, love, mercy of God, nearness to God, oneness with God, peace, quickening of the spirit. I am redeemed, sealed with the Holy Spirit, treasured by God, united with other believers, validated as an authentic child of God. I have God's wisdom, and one day I will be exalted with God. All of those things have been given to each one of us because we have been chosen by God. And Paul tells us just what it is that we've been chosen for. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. So we are chosen to be holy and blameless. But what exactly does that look like? Does it mean living a healthy life, treating our bodies like the temples that they are? Or does it mean living a life that is gentle on creation and respectful of nature? Or does it mean speaking out against injustice or fighting for the rights of those without power or voice? Or does it mean all of these things in turn? Life is a matter of making good choices. And we say that to the children in our lives all the time, make good choices. And we all know it's true, but sometimes it's a difficult thing to do. George Jones was a country music legend from the old school. And a lot of his songs were the typical country cheating and drinking songs. And the fact that he had a drinking problem of his own was no secret. But on March 6, 1999, Jones was critically injured when he crashed his SUV in Nashville. He was later charged with a DUI and said of the crash that it was a significant turning point in his life. When I had that wreck, I made up my mind. It put the fear of God in me. No more smoking, no more drinking. A few months after the accident, he released the album Cold Heart Truth that included the song Choices. And these are the words of the chorus of that song. I've had choices since the day that I was born. There were voices that told me right from wrong. If I had listened, no, I wouldn't be here today living and dying with the choices I've made. We've all made choices in life. Life is a matter of making choices, and we hope and pray that the ones we make are good ones. But maybe the most surprising choice that we have is the one that God has given us. We have already been chosen by God, but God still leaves the choice up to us. I don't know how many of you have watched Bridgerton on Netflix, but there's a scene near the end of the season, and I don't think I need a spoiler alert for what I'm about to say. But Lady Bridgerton is speaking with her daughter about marriage, and that she, she admits that even when two people love each other very much, marriage can be challenging. And she tells her daughter that she and the girl's father made a choice every day to do the best they could to love each other. And the same is true in our relationship with God. Each and every day, we can choose to live as children of God, holy and blameless. Now, when Paul writes that God chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless, God knew that we could never be completely holy and blameless. But in love, that is how God sees us. And that is God's hope for us. God wants the best for us, just like every loving parent wants only the best for their children. A life of health and wholeness, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And the one choice that we can make to make all our other choices easier is the choice to live as a child of God. Some of you are probably familiar with the name Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard was a 19th century philosopher, theologian, and poet and is now known as one of the greatest Christian thinkers of his generation. 
but he was far from revered in his own day, and I was once told by a seminary professor that for decades after his death, no Danish children were named Soren <laughs> because, because he was so negatively viewed, although it's gaining in popularity, apparently. He is known as the father of Christian existentialism, which emphasizes immediate commitment to Christ in one's life. Kierkegaard believed that no person is truly alive who simply acts as a spectator toward the ultimate issues of life. He proposed that a person must make independent choices which then define their existence. Each person suffers the pain of indecision until they commit to a particular choice about how to live. The only person who knows real existence is the person who here and now gives himself or herself to the call of Christ. Kierkegaard contended that there are only two kinds of people in the world, those who choose and those who let happen. The heart of our existence is found in our choices, and the primary choice that we confront is whether to live as children of God through Christ. When we do that, everything else falls into place. You have been chosen before creation to be God's child. What have you chosen? Are you even aware of the choices that you have made and the choices that you still have available to you? Returning to polar bears for a minute, psychologists John Grinder and Richard Bandler tell a story about a renovation that took place at the Denver Zoo. The zoo had decided to build a large enclosure for a polar bear. Unfortunately, the polar bear showed up at the zoo before the enclosure was finished. And so they had to put the polar bear in a cage until they could finish the habitat. The cage was just big enough that the polar bear could take three long strides in one direction and then turn around and take three long strides back again. And the polar bear spent several months in that cage with those bars restricting his behavior three steps one way and three steps back. Now eventually the enclosure was completed around the cage where the polar bear had been living and he was sedated and the cage was simply removed from around him, which to me sounds like a pretty good way of doing things. But when the polar bear came out of sedation, he got up and he took three steps slowly in one direction and then turned around and took three steps back in the other direction. And then again, three steps one way and three steps back. Although he was no longer caged, he wasn't free because he wasn't able to see the choices available to him. As we begin a new year, we find ourselves in that space between what was and what will be and what could be depending on the choices we make. Maybe some of us feel as if we've been living in a cage and it wouldn't be surprising right now. The new year is a time for letting go and a time for taking up. Letting go of fears and guilt and maybe promises broken and taking up new commitments and new ways of living and new choices in Christ. As the graphic in the bulletin reminds us, we have been given 12 new chapters and 365 new chances. And whether or not our lives always reflect it, we are already chosen as children of God. We just need to make the choice to live as if we believe it. Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Loving God, who chose us before the foundation of the world to be your children, we come before you now in prayer, aware of the times that we have fallen short of your will for our lives, but also aware of your love that sent your Son into the world to reveal your grace and your forgiveness. Help us to remain faithful to you, Help us to choose to live as your children in this world. Guide us in reflecting your love for all creation and in caring for the world in which we live and one another. May we continue to find new ways to reach out to your children who do not yet know of your love for them. And may we seek peace and justice in your name and let go of society's expectations and care only for yours. We hold in prayer all your children in need. We pray for all who face illness, for those in the hospital, for those facing the end of this earthly life, and for all who grieve. We pray for your presence with any who are facing uncertainty or who are making difficult decisions that they might find comfort in knowing that you are with them. We pray for the joys and the concerns that are known to us and that we now lift up to you in our hearts. to pray for all who are on the prayer list of this community of faith. We ask that you be with leaders in this community, in this country, and around the world, that they might be led to do your will. As we begin a new year, help us to let go of anything that might weigh us down, any guilt or regret or fear that keeps us tied to the past that we can walk freely into what you have in store for us in the year to come. We know that you hear these prayers and that you are with us in all things. We ask that you continue to guide us as we seek to live according to the life of our Savior, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Resurrection 
and the creation of your church for its mission in the world. We give thanks for all the saints who have gone before us to reveal to us what it means to be children of God. Strengthened by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you and join with your faithful people everywhere to glorify you. Holy, 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 God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna in the highest. On the night of your betrayal, you took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to your disciples and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup is poured out as a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on this bread and cup. Bless all who come to your table that we might become the body of Christ, your servant people in the world. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in new life Christ gives. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the cup of blessing poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Let us join in prayer. We give you thanks for your presence at this table. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us faithful to your will. Whether we are gathered or scattered, may we be the servant church the servant Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We have received God's gifts at this table. Now go out into the world knowing that you are chosen as a child of God. Go with the grace of God, the peace of our Lord, and the power of the Holy Spirit to the praise of God's glory. Amen. Amen. And we will close by singing hymn number 154, Go Tell It All.